Introduction to The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction as this work professes in its title page to be a descriptive tale, they who will take the trouble to read it may be glad to know how much of its contents is literal fact and how much is intended to represent a general picture. The author is very sensible that, had he confined himself to the latter, always the most effective as it is the most valuable mode of conveying knowledge of this nature, he would have made a far better book. But in commencing to describe scenes, and perhaps he may add characters, that were so familiar to his own youth, there was a constant temptation to delineate that which he had known, rather than that which he might have imagined. This rigid adhesion to truth, an indispensable requisite in history and travels, destroys the charm of fiction. For all that is necessary to be conveyed to the mind by the latter had better be done by delineations of principles and of characters in their classes than by too fastidious attention to originals. New York having but one county off Otsego, and the Susquehanna but one proper source, there can be no mistake as to the site of the tale. The history of this district of country so far as it is concerned with civilized men, is soon told. Otsego, in common with most of the interior of the province of New York, was included in the county of Albany previously to the War of the Separation. It then became, in a subsequent division of territory, a part of Montgomery, and finally, having obtained a sufficient population of its own, it was set apart as a county by itself shortly after the peace of 1783. It lies among those low spurs of the Alleghanies, which cover the midland counties of New York, and is a little east of a meridional line drawn through the center of the state. As the water of New York flow either southerly into the Atlantic or northerly into Ontario and its outlet, Otsego Lake being the source of the Susquehanna, is of necessity among its highest lands. The face of the country, the climate as it is found by the whites, and the manners of the settlers are described with a minuteness for which the author has no other apology than the force of his own recollections. Otsego is said to be a word compounded of ot, a place of meeting, and sago or sago, the ordinary term of salutation used by the Indians of this region. There is a tradition which says that the neighboring tribes were accustomed to meet on the banks of the lake to make their treaties, and otherwise to strengthen their alliances, and which refers the name to this practice. As the Indian agent of New York had a log dwelling at the foot of the lake, however, it is not impossible that the appellation grew out of the meetings that were held at his council fires. The war drove off the agent, in common with the other officers of the crown, and his rude dwelling was soon abandoned. The author remembers it a few years later, reduced to the humble office of a smokehouse. In 1779, an expedition was sent against the hostile Indians who dwelt about a hundred miles west of Otsego on the banks of the Cayuga. The whole country was then in wilderness, and it was necessary to transport the baggage of the troops by means of the rivers, a devious but practicable route. One brigade ascended the Mohawk until it reached the point nearest to the sources of the Susquehanna, whence it cut a lane through the forest to the head of the Otsego. The boats and baggage were carried over this portage, and the troops proceeded to the other extremity of the lake, where they disembarked and encamped. The Susquehanna, 
a narrow though rapid stream at its source, was much filled with floodwood or fallen trees, and the troops adopted a novel expedient to facilitate their passage. The Otsego is about nine miles in length, varying in breadth from half a mile to a mile and a half. The water is of great depth, limpid, and supplied from a thousand springs. At its foot, the banks are rather less than thirty feet high, the remainder of its margin being in mountains, intervals, and points. The outlet, or the Susquehanna, flows through a gorge in the low banks just mentioned, which may have a width of two hundred feet. This gorge was dammed, and the waters of the lake collected. The Susquehanna was converted into a rill. When all was ready, the troops embarked. The dam was knocked away, the Otsego poured out its torrent, and the boats went merrily down with the current. General James Clinton, the brother of George Clinton, then governor of New York, and the father of DeWitt Clinton, who died governor of the same state in 1827, commanded the brigade employed on this duty. During the stay of the troops at the foot of the Otsego, a soldier was shot for desertion. The grave of this unfortunate man was the first place of human internment that the author ever beheld, as the smokehouse was the first ruin. The swivel alluded to in this work was buried and abandoned by the troops on this occasion, and it was subsequently found in digging the cellars of the author's paternal residence. Soon after the close of the war, Washington, accompanied by many distinguished men, visited the scene of this tale, it is said, with a view to examine the facilities for opening a communication by water with other points of the country. He stayed but a few hours. In 1785, the author's father, who had an interest in extensive tracts of land in this wilderness, arrived with a party of surveyors. The manner in which the scene met his eye is described by Judge Temple. At the commencement of the following year, the settlement began, and from that time to this, the country has continued to flourish. It is a singular feature of American life that at the beginning of this century, when the proprietor of the estate had occasion for settlers on a new settlement and in a remote county, he was enabled to draw them from among the increase of the former colony. Although the settlement of this part of Otsego a little preceded the birth of the author, it was not sufficiently advanced to render it desirable that an event so important to himself should take place in the wilderness. Perhaps his mother had a reasonable distrust of the practice of Dr. Todd, who must then have been in the novitiate of his experimental acquirements. Be that as it may, the author was brought an infant into this valley, and all his first impressions were here obtained. He has inhabited it ever since, at intervals, and he thinks he can answer for the faithfulness of the picture he has drawn. Otsego has now become one of the most populous districts of New York. It sends forth its immigrants, like any other old region, and it is pregnant with industry and enterprise. Its manufacturers are prosperous, and it is worthy of remark that one of the most ingenious machines known in European art is derived from the keen ingenuity which is exercised in this remote region. In order to prevent mistake, it may be well to say that the incidents of this tale are purely a fiction. The literal facts are chiefly connected with the natural and artificial objects and the customs of the inhabitants. Thus the academy and the courthouse and jail and inn and most similar things are tolerably exact. They have all long since given place to other buildings of a more pretending character. There is also some liberty taken with the truth in the description of the principal dwelling. The real building had no firstly and lastly. It was of bricks. 
and not of stone, and its roof exhibited none of the peculiar beauties of the composite order. It was erected in an age too primitive for that ambitious school of architecture, but the author indulged his recollections freely when he had fairly entered the door. Here all is literal, even to the severed arm of Wolf and the urn which held the ashes of Queen Dido. Footnote. The forests still crown the mountains of Otsego. The bear, the wolf, and the panther are nearly strangers to them. Even the innocent deer is rarely seen bounding beneath their arches, for the rifle and the activity of the settlers have driven them to other haunts. To this change, which in some particulars is melancholy to one who knew the country in its infancy, it may be added that the Otsego is beginning to be a niggard of its treasures. End footnote. The author has elsewhere said that the character of leather stocking is a creation, rendered probable by such auxiliaries as were necessary to produce that effect. Had he drawn still more upon fancy, the lovers of fiction would not have so much cause for their objections to his work. Still, the picture would not have been in the least true without some substitutes for most of the other personages. The great proprietor resident on his lands, and giving his name to instead of receiving it from his estates as in Europe, is common over the whole of New York. The physician, with his theory rather obtained from than corrected by experiments on the human constitution, the pious, self-denying, laborious, and ill-paid missionary, the half-educated, litigious, envious, and disreputable lawyer, with his counterpoise, a brother of the profession, of better origin and of better character, the shiftless, bargaining, discontented seller of his betterments, the plausible carpenter, and most of the others are more familiar to all who have ever dwelt in a new country. It may be well to say here, a little more explicitly, that there was no real intention to describe with particular accuracy any real characters in this book. It has been often said, and in published statements, that the heroine of this book was drawn after the sister of the writer, who was killed by a fall from a horse now near half a century since. So ingenious is conjecture that a personal resemblance has been discovered between the fictitious character and the deceased relative. It is scarcely possible to describe two females of the same class in life who would be less alike personally than Elizabeth Temple and the sister of the author who met with the deplorable fate mentioned. In a word, they are as unlike in this respect as in history, character, and fortunes. Circumstances rendered the sister singularly dear to the author. After a lapse of half a century, he is writing this paragraph with a pain which would induce him to cancel it were it not still more painful to have it believed that one whom he regarded with a reverence that surpassed the love of a brother was converted by him into the heroine of a work of fiction. From circumstances which, after this introduction, will be obvious to all, the author has had more pleasure in writing The Pioneers than the book will probably ever give any of its readers. He is quite aware of its numerous faults, some of which he has endeavored to repair in this edition. But, as he has an intention at least done his full share of amusing the world, he trusts to its good nature for overlooking this attempt to please himself. End of Introduction This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the spring of 2008.
of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Quote, See, winter comes to rule the varied years, sullen and sad, with all his rising train, vapors and clouds and storms. Unquote. By Thompson. Near the center of the state of New York lies an extensive district of country whose surface is a succession of hills and dales, or, to speak with greater deference to geographical definitions, of mountains and valleys. It is among these hills that the Delaware takes its rise, and flowing from the limpid lakes and thousand springs of this region, the numerous sources of the Susquehanna meander through the valleys until, uniting their streams, they form one of the proudest rivers of the United States. The mountains are generally arable to the tops, although instances are not wanting where the sides are jutted with rocks that aid greatly in giving the country that romantic and picturesque character which it so eminently possesses. The vales are narrow, rich, and cultivated, with a stream uniformly winding through each. Beautiful and thriving villages are found interspersed among the margins of the small lakes, or situated at those points of the streams which are favorable for manufacturing, and neat and comfortable farms, with every indication of wealth about them, are scattered profusely through the vales, and even to the mountain tops. Roads diverge in every direction from the even and graceful bottoms of the valleys to the most rugged and intricate passes of the hills. Academies and minor edifices of learning meet the eye of the stranger at every few miles as he winds his way through this uneven territory and places for the worship of God abound with that frequency which characterize a moral and reflecting people, and with that variety of exterior and canonical government which flows from unfettered liberty of conscience. In short, the whole district is hourly exhibiting how much can be done. In even a rugged country, with a severe climate, under the dominion of mild laws, and where every man feels a direct interest in the prosperity of a commonwealth of which he knows himself to form a part. The expedients of the pioneers who first broke ground in the settlement of this country are succeeded by the permanent improvements of the yeoman who intends to leave his remains to moulder under the sod which he tills, or perhaps of the son, who, born in the land, piously wishes to linger around the grave of his father. Only forty years have passed since this territory was a wilderness. Footnote. Our tale begins in 1793. About seven years after the commencement of one of the earliest of those settlements, which have conduced to effect that magical change in the power and condition of the state to which we have alluded. End footnote. Very soon after the establish of the independence of the states by the peace of 1783, the enterprise of their citizens was directed to a development of the natural advantages of their widely extended dominions. Before the War of the Revolution, the inhabited parts of the colony of New York were limited to less than a tenth of its possessions. A narrow belt of country, extending a short distance on either side of the Hudson, with a similar occupation of fifty miles on the banks of the Mohawk, together with the islands of Nassau and Staten, 
and a few insulated settlements on chosen land along the margins of streams, composed the country, which was then inhabited by less than two hundred thousand souls. Within the short period we have mentioned, the population has spread itself over five degrees of latitude and seven of longitude, and has swelled to a million and a half inhabitants, who are maintained in abundance, and can look forward to ages before the evil day must arrive when their possessions shall become unequal to their wants. It was near the setting of the sun, on a clear, cold day in December, when a sleigh was moving slowly up one of the mountains in the district we have described. The day had been fine for the season, and but two or three large clouds, whose color seemed brightened by the light reflected from the mass of snow that covered the earth, floated in a sky of the purest blue. The road wound along the brow of a precipice, and on one side was upheld by a foundation of logs piled one upon the other, while a narrow excavation in the mountain in the opposite direction had made a passage of sufficient width for the ordinary traveling of that day. But logs, excavation, and everything that did not reach several feet above the earth lay alike buried beneath the snow. A single track, barely wide enough to receive the sleigh, denoted the route of the highway, and this was sunk nearly two feet below the surrounding surface. Footnote. Sleigh is the word used in every part of the United States to denote a traineau. It is of local use in the west of England, whence it is most probably derived by the Americans. The latter draw a distinction between a sled or sledge and a sleigh, the sleigh being shod with metal. Sleighs are also subdivided into two-horse and one-horse sleighs. Of the latter, there are the cutter, with thills so arranged as to permit the horse to travel in the side track, the pung or toe pung, which is driven with a pole, and the gumper, a rude construction used for temporary purposes in the new countries. Many of the American sleighs are elegant though the use of this mode of conveyance is much lessened with the amelioration of the climate consequent to the clearing of the forest. And footnote. In a vale which lay at a distance of several hundred feet lower, there was what in the language of the country was called a clearing, and all the usual improvements of a new settlement. These even extended up the hill, to the point where the road turned short and ran across the level land, which lay on the summit of the mountain. But the summit itself remained in the forest. There was glittering in the atmosphere, as if it was filled with innumerable shining particles, and the noble bay horses that drew the sleigh were covered, in many parts of their coat, of hoarfrost. The vapor from their nostrils was seen to issue like smoke, and every object in the view, as well as every arrangement of the travelers, denoted the depth of winter in the mountains. The harness, which was of a deep, dull black, differing from the glossy varnishing of the present day, was ornamented with enormous plates and buckles of brass, that shone like gold in those transient beams of the sun which found their way obliquely through the tops of the trees. Huge saddles, studded with nails and fitted with cloth, that served as blankets to the shoulders of the cattle, supported four high, square-topped turrets, through which the stout reins led from the mouths of the horses to the hands of the driver, who was a negro of apparently twenty years of age. His face which nature had colored with a glistening black, was now mottled with the cold, and his large shining eyes, filled with tears, a tribute to its power that the keen frost of those regions always extracted 
from one of his African origin. Still, there was a smiling expression of good humor in his happy countenance that was created by the thoughts of home and a Christmas fireside with its Christmas frolics. The sleigh was one of those large, comfortable, old-fashioned conveyances, which would admit a whole family within its bosom, but which now contained only two passengers besides the driver. The color of its outside was a modest green, and that of its inside a fiery red. The latter was intended to convey the idea of heat in that cold climate. Large buffalo skins trimmed around the edges with red cloth cut into festoons covered the back of the sleigh, and were spread over its bottom and drawn up around the feet of the travelers, one of whom was a man of middle age, and the other a female just entering into womanhood. The former was of large stature, but the precautions he had taken to guard against the cold left but little of his person exposed to view. A great coat that was abundantly ornamented by a profusion of furs enveloped the whole of his figure excepting the head, which was covered with a cap of marten skins lined with morocco, the sides of which were made to fall if necessary, and were now drawn close over the ears and fastened beneath his chin with a black ribbon. The top of the cap was surmounted with the tail of the animal whose skin had furnished the rest of the materials, which fell back, not ungracefully, a few inches behind the head. From beneath this mask were to be seen part of a fine manly face, and particularly a pair of expressive large blue eyes that promised extraordinary intellect, covert humor, and great benevolence. The form of his companion was literally hid beneath the garment she wore. There were furs and silks peeping from under a large camlet cloak with a thick flannel lining that by its cut and size was evidently intended for a masculine wearer. A huge hood of black silk that was quilted with down concealed the whole of her head, except that a small opening in front for beneath through which occasionally sparked a pair of animated, jet-black eyes. Both the father and daughter, for such was the connection between the two travelers, were too much occupied with their reflections to break a stillness that derived little or no interruption from the easy gliding of the sleigh by the sound of their voices. The former was thinking of the wife that had held this their only child to her bosom, when, four years before, she had reluctantly consented to relinquish the society of her daughter, in order that the latter might enjoy the advantages of an education which the city of New York could only offer at that period. A few months afterward, death had deprived him of the remaining companion of his solitude. But still, he had enough real regard for his child not to bring her into the comparative wilderness in which he dwelt, until the full period had expired to which he had limited her juvenile labors. The reflections of the daughter were less melancholy, and mingled with a pleased astonishment at the novel scenery she met at every turn in the road. The mountain on which they were journeying was covered with pines that rose without a branch some seventy or eighty feet, and which frequently doubled that height by the addition of the tops. Through the innumerable vistas that opened beneath the lofty trees, the eye could penetrate until it was met by a distant inequality in the ground, or was stopped by a view of the summit of the mountain, which lay on the opposite side of the valley to which they were hastening. The dark trunks of the trees rose from the pure white of the snow in regularly formed shafts, until at a great height their branches shot forth horizontal limbs that were covered with the meager foliage of an evergreen, affording a melancholy contrast to the torpor of nature below. 
To the travellers there seemed to be no wind, but these pines waved majestically at their topmost boughs, sending forth a dull, plaintive sound that was quite in consonance with the rest of the melancholy scene. The sleigh had glided for some distance along the even surface, and the gaze of the female was bent in inquisitive and, perhaps, timid glances into the recesses of the forest, when a loud and continued howling was heard, pealing under the long arches of the woods like the cry of a numerous pack of hounds. The instant the sounds reached the ear of the gentleman, he cried aloud to the black, Hold up, Aggie! There is old Hector! I should know his bay among ten thousand! The leather stocking has put his hounds into the hills this clear day, and they have started their game. There's a deer track a few rods ahead, and now, Bess, if thou canst muster courage enough to stand fire, I will give thee a saddle for thy Christmas dinner. The black drew up with a cheerful grin upon his chilled features, and began thrashing his arm together in order to restore the circulation of his fingers, while the speaker stood erect and throwing aside his outer covering, stepped from the sleigh upon a bank of snow, which sustained his weight without yielding. In a few moments the speaker succeeded in extricating a double-barreled filing piece from among a multitude of trunks and bandboxes. After throwing aside the thick mittens which had encased his hands, there now appeared a pair of leather gloves tipped with fur. He examined his priming and was about to move forward when the light bounding noise of an animal plunging through the woods was heard, and a fine buck darted into the path a short distance ahead of him. The appearance of the animal was sudden, and his flight inconceivably rapid, but the traveller appeared to be too keen a sportsman to be disconcerted by either. As it came first into view, he raised the fowling piece to his shoulder, and with a practiced eye and steady hand, drew the trigger. The deer dashed forward, undaunted and apparently unhurt. Without lowering his piece, the traveler turned its muzzle toward his victim and fired again. Neither discharge, however, seemed to have taken effect. The whole scene had passed with a rapidity that confused the female who was unconsciously rejoicing in the escape of the buck. Has he rather darted like a meteor than ran across the road, when a sharp, quick sound struck her ear, quite different from the full round reports of her father's gun, but still sufficiently distinct to be known as the concussion produced by firearms. At the same instant that she heard this unexpected report, the buck sprang from the snow to a great height in the air, and directly a second discharge, similar to the sound of the first, followed, when the animal came to the earth, failing headlong and rolling all over on the crust, with its own velocity. A loud shout was given by the unseen marksman, and a couple of men instantly appeared from behind the trunks of two of the pines, where they had evidently placed themselves in expectation of the passage of the deer. Ha, ah, Natty! Had I known you were in ambush, I should not have fired, cried the traveller, moving toward the spot where the deer lay, near to which he was followed by the delighted black with his sleigh. But the sound of old Hector was too exhilarating to be quiet, though I hardly think I struck him either. No, no, Judge, returned the hunter, with an inward chuckle and with that look of exultation that indicates a consciousness of superior skill. You burnt your powder only to warm your nose this cold evening. Did ye think to stop a full-grown buck with Hector and the slut, open upon him within sound, with that pop-gun in your hand? There's plenty of pheasants among the swamps, and the snowbirds are flying round your own door, where you may feed them with crumbs and shoot them at pleasure any day. But if you're for a buck, or a little bear's meat, Judge, 
you will have to take the long rifle with a greased wadding, or you'll waste more powder than you'll fill stomachs, I'm thinking. As the speaker concluded, he drew his bare hand across the bottom of his nose and again opened his enormous mouth with a kind of inward laugh. The gun scatters well, Matty, and it's killed a deer before now, said the traveler, smiling good-humoredly. One barrel was charged with buckshot, but the other was loaded for birds only. Here are two hurts, one through the neck and the other directly through the heart. It is by no means certain, Natty, that I gave him one of the two. Let who will kill him, said the hunter rather surly. I suppose the creature is to be eaten. So saying, he drew a large knife from a leathern sheath, which was stuck through his girdle or sash, and cut the throat of the animal. If there are two balls through the deer, I would ask if there weren't two rifles fired. Besides, who ever saw such a ragged hole from a smooth bore as this through the neck? And you will own yourself, Judge, that the buck fell at the last shot, which was sent from a truer and younger hand than your or mine either. But for my part, although I am a poor man, I can live without the venison. But I don't love to give up my lawful dues in a free country, though for the matter of that, might often makes right here as well as in the old country, for what I can see. An air of sullen dissatisfaction pervaded the manner of the hunter during the whole of his speech, yet he thought it prudent to utter the close of the sentence in such an undertone as to leave nothing audible but the grumbling sounds of his voice. "'Nay, Natty,' rejoined the traveller, with undisturbed good humour, "'it is for the honour that I contend. A few dollars will pay for the venison, but what will requite me for the lost honour of the buck's tail in my cap? Think, Natty, how I should triumph over that quizzling dog Dick Jones, who has failed seven times already this season, and has only brought in one woodchuck and few gray squirrels. Ah, the game is becoming too hard to find. Indeed, Judge. With your clearings and betterments, said the old hunter, with a kind of compelled resignation, the time was when I have shot thirteen deer without counting the fawns standing in the door of my own hut. And for bear's meat, if one wanted a ham or so, he had only to watch a night's, and he could shoot one by moonlight through the cracks of the logs. No fear of oversleeping himself either, for the howling of the wolves was certain to keep his eyes open. There's old Hector panting with affection a tall hound of black and yellow spots with white belly and legs, that just then came in on the scent, accompanied by the slut he had mentioned. See where the wolves bit his throat the night I drove them from the venison that was smoking on the chimney-top? That dog is more to be trusted than many a Christian man, for he never forgets a friend and loves the hand that gives him bread. There was a peculiarity in the manner of the hunter that attracted the notice of the young female, who had been a close and interested observer of his appearance and equipments. From the moment he came into view, he was tall, and so meager as to make him seem above even the six feet that he actually stood in his stockings. On his head, which was thinly covered with lank sandy hair, he wore a cap made of fox-skin, resembling in shape the one we have already described, although much inferior in finish and ornaments. His face was skinny and thin, almost to emaciation, but yet it bore no signs of disease. On the contrary, it had every indication of the most robust and enduring health. The cold and exposure had, together, given a colorful uniform red. His gray eyes 
were glancing under a pair of shaggy brows that overhung them in long hairs of gray mingled with their natural hue his scraggy neck was bare and burnt to the same tint with his face although a small part of a shirt collar made of the country check was to be seen above the overdress he wore a kind of coat made of dressed deerskin with the hair on was belted close to his lank body by a girdle of colored worsted on his feet were deerskin moccasins ornamented with porcupine quills after the manner of the indians and his limbs were guarded with long leggings of the same material as the moccasins which guardering above the knees of his tarnished buckskin breeches had obtained for him among the settlers the nickname of leather stocking over his left shoulder was slung a belt of deerskin from which depended an enormous ox horn so thinly scraped as to discover the powder it contained the larger end was fitted ingeniously and securely with a wooden bottom and the other was stopped tight by a little plug a leathern pouch hung before him from which as he concluded his last speech he took a small measure and filling it accurately with powder he commenced reloading the rifle which as its butt rested on the snow before him reached nearly to the top of his foxskin cap the traveller had been closely examining the wounds during these movements and now without heeding the ill-humour of the hunter's manner he exclaimed i would fain establish a right natty to the honour of this death and surely if the hit in the neck be mine it is enough for the shot in the heart was unnecessary what we call an act of supererogation leather stocking you may call it what learned name you please judge said the hunter throwing his rifle across his left arm and knocking up a brass lid in the breech from which he took a small piece of greased leather and wrapping a bale in it forced them down by main strength on the powder where he continued to pound them while speaking it's far easier to call names than to shoot a buck on the spring but the creature came to his end from a younger hand than either urine or mine as i said before what say you my friend cried the traveller turning pleasantly to natty's companion shall we toss up this dollar for the honour and you keep the silver if you lose what say you friend that i killed the deer answered the young man with a little haughtiness as he leaned on another long rifle similar to that of natty here are two to one indeed replied the judge with a smile i am outvoted overruled as we say on the bench there is aggie he can't vote being a slave and bess is a minor so i must even make the best of it but you'll send me the venison and the deuces in it but i make a good story about its death this meat is not mine to sell said leather stocking adopting a little of his companion's hauteur for my part i've known animals travel for days with shots in the neck and i'm none of them who rob a man of his rightful dues you are tenacious of your rights this cold evening natty returned the judge with unconquerable good nature but what say you young man will three dollars pay you for the buck first let us determine the question of right to the satisfaction of us both said the youth firmly but respectfully and with a pronunciation and language vastly superior to his appearance with how many shot did you load your gun with five sir said the judge a little struck with the other's manner are they not enough to slay a buck like this one would do it but moving to the tree from behind which he had appeared you know sir you fired in this direction here are four of the bullets in the tree 
the judge examined the fresh marks in the bark of the pine, and shaking his head, said with a laugh, You are making out the case against yourself, my young advocate. Where is the fifth? Here, said the youth, throwing aside the rough overcoat that he wore, and exhibiting a hole in his undergarment, through which large drops of blood were oozing. Good God! exclaimed the judge with horror. Have I been trifling here about an empty distinction and a fellow creature suffering from my hands without a murmur? But hasten, quick, get into my sleigh. It is but a mile to the village, where surgical aid can be obtained. All shall be done at my expense, and thou shalt live with me until my, thy wound is healed. I am forever afterward. I thank you for your good intention, but I must decline your offer. I have a friend who would be uneasy were he to hear that I am hurt and away from him. The injury is but slight, and the bullet has missed the bones. But I believe, sir, you will now admit me title to the venison. Admit, repeated the agitated judge. I here give thee a right to shoot deer or bears or anything thou pleasest in my woods forever. Leather stocking is the only other man that I have granted the same privilege to, and the time is coming when it will be of value. But I buy your deer here. This bill will pay thee both for thy shot and my own. The old hunter gathered his tall person up into an air of pride during this dialogue, but he waited until the other had done speaking. There's them living who say that Nathaniel Bumpo's right to shoot on these hills is of older date than Marmaduke Temple's right to forbid him, he said. But if, if there is a law about it at all, though who ever heard of a law that a man shouldn't kill deer where he pleased, but if there is a law at all, it should keep people from the use of smooth bores. A body never knows where his lead will fly when he pulls the trigger on one of them uncertain firearms. Without attending to the soliloquy of Natty, the youth bowed his head silently to the offer of the banknote and replied, Excuse me, I have need of the venison. But this will buy you many, dear, said the judge. Take it, I entreat you. And lowering his voice to a whisper, he added, It is for a hundred dollars. For an instant only, the youth seemed to hesitate, and then blushing, even through the high color that the cold had given his cheeks, as if an inward shame at his own weakness, he again declined the offer. During this scene, the female arose, and regardless of the cold air, she threw back the hood which concealed her features, and now spoke with great earnestness. Surely, surely, young man, sir, you... You would not pain my father so much as to have him think that he leaves a poor fellow creature in this wilderness whom his own hand has injured? I entreat you will go with us and receive medical aid. Whether his wound became more painful, or there was something irresistible in the voice and manner of the fair pleader for her father's feelings, we know not. But the distance of the young man's manner was sensibly softened by this appeal, and he stood in apparent doubt, as if reluctant to comply with, and yet unwilling to refuse her request. The judge, for such being his office much in future be his title, watched with no little interest the display of this singular contention in the feelings of the youth, and advancing, kindly took his hand as he pulled him gently toward the sleigh, urged him to enter it. There is no human aid nearer than Templeton, he said, and the hut of Natty is full three miles from this. Come, come, my young friend, go with us, and let the new doctor look to this shoulder of thine. Here is Natty, who will take the tidings of thy welfare to thy friend, and, shouldst you thou require it, Thou shalt return home in the morning. The young man succeeded in extricating his hand from the warm grasp of the judge, but he continued to gaze on the face of the female, 
who, regardless of the cold, was still standing with her fine features exposed, which expressed feeling that eloquently seconded the request of her father. Leatherstocking stood, in the meantime, leaning upon his long rifle, with his head turned a little to one side, as if engaged in sagacious musing, when, having apparently satisfied his doubts, by revolving the subject in his mind, he broke silence. It may be best to go, lad, after all, for if the shot hangs under the skin, my hand is getting too old to be cutting into human flesh, as I once used to, though some thirty years agone in the old war. When I was out under Sir William, I traveled seventy miles alone in the howling wilderness with a rifle bullet in my thigh, and then cut it out with my own jackknife. Old Indian John knows the time well. I met him with a party of the Delawares on the trail of the Iroquois who had been down and taken five scalps on the Shoharie. But I made a mark on the redskin that I warrant he'll carry to his grave. I took him on the posterium, saving the lady's presence, as he got up from the ambushment and rattled three buckshots into his naked hide, so close that you might have laid a broad joe upon them all. Here Natty stretched out his long neck and straightened his body, as he opened his mouth which exposed a single tusk of yellow bone, while his eyes, his face, even his whole frame seemed to laugh, although no sound was emitted except that kind of thick hissing as he inhaled his breath in quavers. I had lost my bullet mold in crossing the Oneida outlet, and had to make shift with the buckshot. But the rifle was true, and didn't scatter like your two-legged thing here, Judge, which don't do, I find, to hunt in company with. Natty's apology to the delicacy of the young lady was unnecessary, for while he was speaking she was too much employed in helping her father to remove certain articles of baggage to hear him. Unable to resist the kind urgency of the travelers any longer, the youth, though still with an unaccountable reluctance, suffered himself to be persuaded to enter the sleigh. The black, with the aid of his master, threw the buck across the baggage, and entering the vehicle themselves, the judge invited the hunter to do so likewise. "'No, no,' said the old roan, shaking his head. "'I have work to do at home this Christmas Eve. Drive on with the boy, and let your doctor look to the shoulder.' though if he will only cut out the shot, I have yerbs that will heal the wound quicker than all his foreign ointments. He turned and was about to move off when suddenly recollecting himself, he again faced the party and added, If you see anything of Indian John about the foot of the lake, you had better take him with you and let him lend the doctor a hand, for old as he is, he is curious at cuts and bruises, and he is likelier than not, he'll be in with brooms to sweep your Christmas hearths. Stop! Stop! cried the youth, catching the arm of the black as he prepared to urge his horses forward. Natty, you need say nothing of the shot, nor of where I am going. Remember, Natty, as you love me. Trust old Leatherstocking, returned the hunter significantly. He hasn't lived fifty years in the wilderness, and not learnt from the savages how to hold his tongue. Trust me, lad, and remember old Indian John. And Natty, said the youth eagerly, still holding the black by the arm, I will just get the shot extracted, and bring you up to-night a quarter of the buck for the Christmas dinner. He was interrupted by the hunter, who held up his finger with an expressive gesture for silence. He then moved softly along the margin of the road, keeping his eyes steadfastly fixed on the branches of a pine. When he had obtained such a position as he wished, he stood, and cocking his rifle, threw one leg far behind him, and stretching his left arm to its utmost extent along the barrel of his piece, he began slowly to raise its muscle in a line with the straight trunk of the tree. The eyes of the group in the sleigh naturally preceded the movement of the rifle, and they soon discovered the object of Natty's aim, on a small dead branch of the pine, which at the distance of seventy feet from the ground shot out horizontally, immediately beneath the living members of the tree sat a bird, 
that in the vulgar language of the country was indiscriminately called a pheasant or a partridge. In size, it was but little smaller than a common barnyard fowl. The baying of the dogs and the conversation that had passed near the root of the tree on which it was perched had alarmed the bird, which was now drawn up near the body of the pine, with a head and neck so erect as to form nearly a straight line with its legs. As soon as the rifle bore on the victim, Natty drew his trigger, and the partridge fell from its height with a force that buried it in the snow. "'Lie down, you old villain!' exclaimed Leatherstocking, shaking his ramrod at Hector as he bounded toward the foot of the tree. "'Lie down, I say!' The dog obeyed, and Natty proceeded with great rapidity, though with the nicest accuracy, to reload his piece. When this was ended, he took up his game, and showing it to the party, without a head, he cried, "'Here is a tidbit for the old man's Christmas. Never mind the venison, boy.' And remember, Indian John, his yarbs are better than all the foreign intments. Here, Judge, holding up the bird again, do you think a smooth boar would pick game off of their roost and not ruffle a feather? The old man gave another of his remarkable laughs, which partook so largely of exultation, mirth, and irony. And, shaking his head, he turned with his rifle at a trail and moved into the forest with steps that were between a walk and a trot. At each movement he made his body lowered several inches, his knees yielding with an inclination inward. But as the sleigh turned at a bend in the road, the youth cast his eyes in quest of his old companion, and he saw that he was already nearly concealed by the trunks of the tree, while his dogs were following quietly in his footsteps, occasionally scenting the deer track that they seemed to know instinctively was now of no further use to them another jerk was given to the sleigh and leather stocking was hid from view end of chapter one this reading by gary w sherwin of yukon pennsylvania in the spring of two thousand and eight Two of the Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 Quote all places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man ports and happy havens. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Unquote. From Richard the Second. An ancestor of Marmaduke Temple had, about a hundred and twenty years before the commencement of our tale, come to the colony of Pennsylvania, a friend and co-religionist of its great patron. Old Marmaduke, for this formidable prenomen was a kind of appellative to the race, brought with him to that asylum of the persecuted an abundance of the good things of this life. He became the master of many thousands of acres of uninhabited territory, and the supporter of many a score of dependents. He lived greatly respected for his piety and not a little distinguished as a secretary, was entrusted by his associates with many important political stations, and died just in time to escape the knowledge of his own poverty. It was his lot to share the fortune of most of those who brought wealth with them into the new settlements of the middle colonies. The consequence of an immigrant into these provinces was generally to be ascertained by the number of his white servants or dependents, and the nature of the public situations that he held. Taking this rule as a guide, the ancestor of our judge must have been a man of no little note. It is, however, a subject of curious inquiry at the present day to look into the brief records of that early period, 
and observe how regular, and with few exceptions how inevitable, were the gradations on one hand of the masters to poverty, and on the other of their servants to wealth. Accustomed to ease, and unequal to the struggles incident to an infant society, the affluent immigrant was barely enabled to maintain his own rank by the weight of his personal superiority and acquirements. But the moment that his head was laid in the grave, his indolent and comparatively uneducated offspring were compelled to yield precedency to the more active energies of a class whose exertion had been stimulated by necessity. This is a very common course of things, even in the present state of the Union, but it was peculiarly the fortunes of the two extremes of society in the peaceful and unenterprising colonies of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. The posterity of Marmaduke did not escape the common lot of those who depend rather on their hereditary possessions than on their own powers, and in the third generation they had descended to a point below which, in this happy country, it is barely possible for honesty, intellect, and sobriety to fall. The same pride of family that had by itself satisfied indolence, conduced to aid their fail, now became a principle to stimulate them to endeavor to rise again. The feeling from being morbid was changed to a healthful and active desire to emulate the character, the condition, and, peradventure, the wealth of their ancestors also. It was the father of our new acquaintance, the judge, who first began to reascend in the scale of society, and, in this undertaking, he was not a little assisted by a marriage, which aided in furnishing the means of educating his only son in a rather better manner than the low state of the common schools of Pennsylvania could promise, or that had been the practice in the family for the two or three preceding generations. At the school, where the reviving prosperity of his father was enabled to maintain him, young Marmaduke formed an intimacy with a youth whose years were about equal to his own. This was a fortunate connection for our judge, and paved the way for most of his future elevation in life. There was not only great wealth, but high court interest among the connections of Edward Effingham. They were one of the few families then resident in the colonies, who thought it a degradation to its members to descend to the pursuits of commerce, and who never emerged from the privacy of domestic life, unless to preside in the councils of the colony, or to bear arms in her defense. The latter had from youth been the only employment of Edward's father. Military rank under the crown of Britain was attained with much longer probation and by much more toilsome service sixty years ago than at the present time. Years were passed without murmuring in the subordinate grades of the service, and those soldiers who were stationed in the colonies felt when they obtained the command of a company that they were entitled to receive the greatest deference from the peaceful occupants of the soil. Any one of our readers who has the occasion to cross the Niagara may easily observe not only the self-importance, but the real estimation enjoyed by the humblest representative of the crown, even in that polar region of royal sunshine. Such and at no very distant period was the respect paid to the military in these states, where now, happily, no symbol of war is ever seen, unless at the free and tearless voice of their people. When, therefore, the father of Marmaduke's friend, after forty years' service, retired with the rank of major, maintaining in his domestic establishment a comparative splendor, he became a man of the first consideration in his native colony, which was that of New York. He had served with fidelity and courage, and having been according to the custom of the provinces, entrusted with commands much superior to those to which he was entitled by rank with reputation also. When Major Effingham 
yielded to the claims of age, he retired with dignity, refusing his half-pay or any other compensation for services that he felt he could no longer perform. The ministry proffered various civil offices, which yielded not only honor but profit, but he declined them all, with the chivalrous independence and loyalty that had marked his character through life. The veteran soon caused this set of patriotic disinterestedness to be followed by another of private munificence. That, however, little it accorded with prudence was in perfect conformity with the simple integrity of his own views. The friend of Marmaduke was his only child, and to this son, on his marriage with a lady to whom the father was particularly partial, the major gave a complete conveyance of his whole estate, consisting of money in the funds, a town and country residence, sundry valuable farms in the old parts of the colony, and large tracts of wild land in the new, in this manner throwing himself upon the final piety of his child for his own future maintenance. Major Effingham, in declining the liberal offers of the British ministry, had subjected himself to the suspicion of having attained his dotage by all those who throng the avenues to court patronage, even in the remotest corners of that vast empire. But when he thus voluntarily stripped himself of his great personal wealth, the remainder of the community seemed instinctively to adopt the conclusion also that he had reached a second childhood. This may explain the fact of his importance rapidly declining, and, if privacy was his object, the veteran had soon a free indulgence of his wishes. Whatever views the world might entertain of this act of the major, to himself and to his child it seemed no more than a natural gift by a father of whose immunities, which he could no longer enjoy or improve, to a son who was formed both by nature and education to do both. The younger Effingham did not object to the amount of the donation for he felt that while his parent reserved a moral control over his actions, he was relieving himself of a fatiguing burden. Such, indeed, was the confidence existing between them, that to neither did it seem anything more than removing money from one pocket to another. One of the first acts of the young man, on coming into possession of his wealth, was to seek his early friend with a view to offer any assistance that it was now in his power to bestow. The death of Marmaduke's father, and the consequent division of his small estate, rendered such an offer extremely acceptable to the young Pennsylvanian. He felt his own powers, and saw not only the excellences, but the foibles in the character of his friend. Effingham was by nature indolent, confiding, and at times impetuous and indiscreet. But Marmaduke was uniformly equable, penetrating, and full of activity and enterprise. To the latter, therefore, the assistance, or rather connection, that was proffered to him seemed to produce a mutual advantage. It was cheerfully accepted and the arrangement of its conditions was easily completed. A mercantile house was established in the metropolis of Pennsylvania, with the avails of Mr. Effingham's personal property, all, or nearly all, of which was put into the possession of Temple, who was the only ostensible proprietor of the concern, while in secret the other was entitled to an equal participation in the profits. This connection was thus kept private for two reasons, one of which, in the freedom of their intercourse, was frankly avowed to Marmaduke, while the other continued profoundly hid in the bosom of his friend. The last was nothing more than pride. To the descendant of a line of soldiers, commerce 
even in that indirect manner, seemed a degrading pursuit, but an insuperable obstacle to the disclosure existed in the prejudices of his father. We have already said that Major Effingham had served as a soldier with reputation, on one occasion while in command of the western frontier of Pennsylvania against the League of the French and Indians, not only his glory, but the safety of himself and his troop were jeopardized by the peaceful policy of that colony. To the soldier this was an unpardonable offense. He was fighting in their defense. He knew that the mild practices of this little nation of practical Christians would be disregarded by their subtle and malignant enemies, and he felt the injury the more deeply because he saw that the avowed object of the colonists in withholding their succors would only have a tendency to expose his command without preserving the peace. The soldier succeeded after a desperate conflict in extricating himself with a handful of his men from their murderous enemy, but he never forgave the people who had exposed him to a danger which they left him to combat alone. It was in vain to tell him that they had no agency in his being placed on their frontier at all. It was evidently for their benefit that he had been so placed, and it was their, quote, religious duty, unquote, so the Major always expressed it. It was their religious duty to have supported him. At no time was the old soldier an admirer of the peaceful disciples of Fox. Their disciplined habits, both of mind and body, had endowed them with great physical perfection, and the eye of the veteran was apt to scan the fair proportions and athletic frames of the colonists with a look that seemed to utter volumes of contempt for their moral imbecility. He was also a little addicted to the expression of a belief that, where there was so great an observance of the externals of religion, there could not be much of the substance. It is not our task to explain what is or what ought to be the substance of Christianity, but merely to record in this place the opinions of Major Effingham. Knowing the sentiments of the father in relation to this people, it was no wonder that the son hesitated to avow his connection with nay, even his dependency on the integrity of a Quaker. It had been said that Marmaduke deduced his origin from the contemporaries and friends of Penn. His father had married without the pale of the church to which he belonged, and had, in this manner, forfeited some of the privileges of his offspring. Still, as young Marmaduke was educated in a colony and society, where even the ordinary intercourse between friends was tinctured with the aspect of this mild religion, his habits and language were somewhat marked by its peculiarities. His own marriage, at a future day, with a lady without not only the pale, but the influence of this sect of religionists, had a tendency, it is true, to weaken his early impressions. Still, he retained them in some degree to the hour of his death, and was observed uniformly, when much interested or agitated, to speak in the language of his youth. But this is anticipating our tale. When Marmaduke first became the partner of young Effingham, he was quite the Quaker in externals, and it is not too dangerous an experiment for the son to think of encountering the prejudices of the father on this subject. The connection, therefore, remained a profound secret to all those who were interested in it. For a few years Marmaduke directed the commercial operations of his house with a prudence and sagacity that afforded rich returns. He married the lady we have mentioned, who was the mother of Elizabeth, and the visits of his friends were becoming more frequent. There was a speedy prospect of removing the veil from their intercourse, as its advantages became each hour more apparent to Mr. Effingham, when the troubles that preceded the War of the Revolution extended themselves to an alarming degree. Educated in the most dependent loyalty, Mr. Effingham 
had, from the commencement of the disputes between the colonists and the crown, warmly maintained that he believed to be the just prerogatives of his prince, while, on the other hand, the clear head and independent mind of Temple had induced him to espouse the cause of the people. Both might have been influenced by early impressions, for if the son of the loyal and gallant soldier bowed in implicit obedience to the will of his sovereign, the descendant of the persecuted followers of Penn looked back with little bitterness on the unmerited wrongs that had been heaped on his ancestors. This difference in opinion had long been a subject of an amicable dispute between them, but latterly the contest was getting to be too important to admit of trivial discussions on the part of Marmaduke, whose acute discernment was already catching faint glimmerings of the important events that were in embryo. The sparks of dissension soon kindled into a blaze, and the colonies, or rather as they quickly declared themselves, the States became a scene of strife and bloodshed for years. A short time before the Battle of Lexington, Mr. Effingham, already a widower, transmitted to Marmaduke for safekeeping all his valuable effects and papers, and left the colony without his father. The war had, however, scarcely commenced in earnest when he reappeared in New York, wearing the livery of his king, and in short time he took the field at the head of a provincial corps. In the meantime, Marmaduke had completely committed himself in the cause, as it was then called, of the rebellion. Of course, all intercourse between the friends ceased. On the part of Colonel Effingham, it was unsought, and on that of Marmaduke, there was a cautious reserve. It soon became necessary for the latter to abandon the capital of Philadelphia, but he had taken the precaution to remove the whole of his effects beyond the reach of the royal forces, including the papers of his friend also. There he continued serving his country during the struggle, in various civil capacities, and always with dignity and usefulness. While, however, he discharged his functions with credit and fidelity, Marmaduke never seemed to lose sight of his own interests, for, when the estates of the adherents of the crown fell under the hammer by the acts of confiscation, he appeared in New York, and became the purchaser of extensive possessions at comparatively low prices. It is true that Marmaduke, by thus purchasing estates that had been wrestled by violence from others, rendered himself obnoxious to the censures of that sect, which at the same time that it discards its children from a full participation in the family union, seems ever unwilling to abandon them entirely to the world. But either his success, or the frequency of the transgression in others, soon wiped off this slight stain from his character, and although there were a few who, dissatisfied with their own fortunes, or conscious of their own demerits, would make dark hints concerning the sudden prosperity of the of the unportioned Quaker, yet his service, and possibly his wealth, soon drove the recollection of these vague conjectures from men's minds. When the war ended, and the independence of the States was acknowledged, Mr. Temple turned his attention from the pursuit of commerce, which was then fluctuating and uncertain, to the settlement of those tracts of land which he had purchased. Aided by a good deal of money, and directed by the suggestions of a strong and practical reason, his enterprise throve to a degree that the climate and rugged face of the country which he selected would seem to forbid. His property increased in a tenfold ratio, and he was already ranked among the most wealthy and important of his countrymen. To inherit this wealth, he had but one child, the daughter whom we have introduced to the reader and whom he was now conveying from school to preside over a household that had too long wanted a mistress. When the district in which his estates lay had become sufficiently populous to be set off as a county 
Mr. Temple had, according to the custom of the new settlements, been selected to fill its highest judicial station. This might make a Templar smile, but in addition to the apology of necessity, there is ever a dignity in talents and experience that is commonly sufficient in any station for the protection of its possessor, and Marmaduke, more fortunate in his native clearness of mind than the judge of King Charles, not only decided right, but was generally able to give a very good reason for it. At all times, such was the universal practice of the country, and the times, and Judge Temple, so far from ranking among the lowest of his judicial contemporaries in the courts of the new counties, felt himself, and was unanimously acknowledged to be, among the first. We shall here close this brief explanation of the history and character of some of our personages, leaving them in future to speak and act for themselves. End of chapter 2 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania In the spring of 2008The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 Quote all that thou seest is nature's handiwork. These rocks that upward throw their mossy brawl, like castled pinnacles of elder times, these venerable stems that slowly rock their towering branches in the wintry gale, that field of frost which glitters in the sun, mocking the whiteness of a marble breast, yet man can mar such works with his rude taste, like some sad spoiler of a virgin's fame. Unquote. Duo some little while elapsed ere marmaduke temple was sufficiently recovered from his agitation to scan the person of his new companion he now observed that he was a youth of some two or three and twenty years of age and rather above the middle height further observation was prevented by the rough overcoat which was belted close to his form by a worsted sash much like the one worn by the old hunter the eyes of the judge, after resting a moment on the figure of the stranger, were raised to a scrutiny of his countenance. There had been a look of care visible in the features of the youth when he first entered the sleigh, that had not only attracted the notice of Elizabeth, but which she had been much puzzled to interpret. His anxiety seemed the strongest when he was enjoining his old companion to secrecy, and even when he had decided and was rather passively suffering himself to be conveyed to the village, the expression of his eyes by no means indicated any great degree of self-satisfaction at the step. But the lines of an uncommonly prepossessing countenance were gradually becoming composed, and he now sat silent and apparently musing. The judge gazed at him for some time with earnestness, and then smiling as if at his own forgetfulness, he said, I believe, my young friend, that terror has driven you from my recollection. Your face is very familiar, and yet, for the honor of a score of bucks tails in my cap, I could not tell your name. I came into the country, but three years since, returned the youth coldly, and I understand you have been absent twice that time. It will be five tomorrow, yet your face is one that I have seen, though it would not be strange, such has been my affright, should I see thee in thy winding sheet, walking past my bed to-night. What sayest thou, Bess? Am I composmentous or not? Fit to charge a grand jury, or what is this now of more pressing necessity, able to do the honors of Christmas Eve in the hall of Templeton? More able to do either, my dear father, 
said a playful voice from under the ample enclosures of the hood, than to kill a deer with a smooth bore. A short pause followed, and the same voice, but in a different accent, continued. We shall have good reasons for our thanksgiving to-night, on more accounts than one. The horses soon reached a point where they seemed to know by instinct that the journey was nearly ended, and bearing on the bits as they tossed their heads, they rapidly drew the sleigh over the level land which lay on top of the mountain, and soon came to the point where the road descended suddenly, but circuitously, into the valley. The judge was roused from his reflections when he saw the four columns of smoke which floated above his own chimneys. As house, village, and valley burst on his sight, he exclaimed cheerfully to his daughter, See, Bess, there is thy resting place for life, and thine too, young man, if you will consent to dwell with us. The eyes of his auditors involuntarily met, and if the color that gathered over the face of Elizabeth was contradicted by the cold expression of her eye, the ambiguous smile that again played about the lips of the stranger seemed equally to deny the probability of his consenting to form one of this family group. The scene was one, however, which might easily warm a heart less given to philanthropy than that of Marmaduke Temple. The side of the mountain on which our travellers were journeying, though not absolutely perpendicular, was so steep as to render great care necessary in descending the rude and narrow path which in that early day wound along the precipices. The negro reined in his impatient steeds, and time was given Elizabeth to dwell on a scene which was so rapidly altering under the hands of man, that it only resembled in its outlines the pictures she had so often studied with delight in childhood. Immediately beneath them lay a seeming plain, glittering without in equality, and buried in mountains. The latter were precipitous, especially on the side of the plain, and chiefly in forest. Here and there the hills fell away in long, low points, and broke the sameness of the outline, or setting to the long and wide field of snow, which without house, tree, fence, or any other fixture, resembled so much spotless cloud settled to the earth. A few dark and moving spots were, however, visible on the even surface, which the eye of Elizabeth knew to be so many sleighs going their several ways to or from the village. On the western border of the plain, the mountains, though equally high, were less precipitous, and as they receded opened into irregular valleys and glens, or were formed into terraces and hollows that admitted of cultivation. Although the evergreens still held domain over many of the hills that rose on this side of the valley, yet the undulating outlines of the distant mountains, covered with forests of beech and maple, gave a relief to the eye, and the promise of a kinder soil. Occasionally spots of white were discoverable amidst the forest of the opposite hills, which announced by the smoke that curled over the tops of the trees, the habitations of man, and the commencement of agriculture. These spots were sometimes, by the aid of united labor, enlarged into what were called settlements, but more frequently were small and insulated. Though not so rapid were the changes, and so persevering the labors of those who had cast their fortunes on the success of the enterprise, that it was not difficult for the imagination of Elizabeth to conceive they were enlarging under her eye while she was gazing in mute wonder at the alterations that a few short years had made in the aspect of the country. The points on the western side of this remarkable plain, on which no plant had taken root, were both larger and more numerous than those on its eastern, and one in particular thrust itself forward in such a manner as to form beautifully curved bays of snow on either side. On its extreme end an oak stretched forward, as if to overshadow with its branches a spot which its roots were forbidden to enter. It had released itself from the thaldron that a growth of centuries had imposed on the branches of the surrounding forest trees, and threw its gnarled and fantastic arms abroad in the wildness of liberty. A dark spot of a few acres in extent at the southern extremity of this beautiful flat, and immediately under the feet of our travelers, alone showed by its rippling surface and vapors which exhaled from it 
that what at first might seem a plain was one of the mountain lakes, locked in the frost of winter. A narrow current rushed impetuously from its bosom at the open place we have mentioned, and was to be traced for miles as it wound its way toward the south through the real valley, by its borders of hemlock and pine, and by the vapor which arose from its warmer surface into the chill atmosphere of the hills. The banks of this lovely basin at its outlet, or southern end, were steep but not high, and in that direction the land continued, far as the eye could reach, a narrow but graceful valley, along which the settlers had scattered their humble habitations, with a profusion that bespoke the quality of the soil and the comparative facilities of intercourse. Immediately on the bank of the lake, and at its foot, stood the village of Templeton. It consisted of some fifty buildings, including those of every description, chiefly built of wood, and which, in their architecture, bore no great marks of taste, but which also, by the unfinished appearance of most of the dwellings, indicated the hasty manner of their construction. To the eye they presented a variety of colors, a few were white in both front and rear, but more bore that expensive color on their fronts only, while their economical but ambitious owners had covered the remaining sides of the edifices with a dingy red. One or two were slowly assuming the russet of age, while the uncovered beams that were to be seen through the broken windows of their second stories showed that either the taste or the vanity of their proprietors had led them to undertake a task which they were unable to accomplish. The whole were grouped in a manner that aped the streets of a city, and were evidently so arranged by the directions of one who looked to the wants of posterity rather than to the convenience of the present incumbents. Some three or four of the better sort of buildings, in addition to the uniformity of their color, were fitted with green blinds, which, at that season at least, were rather strangely contrasted to the chill aspect of the lake, the mountains, the forest, and the wide fields of snow. Before the doors of these pretending dwellings were placed a few saplings, either without branches or possessing only the feeble shoots of one or two summers' growth, that looked not unlike tall grandeurs on posts near the threshold of princes. In truth, the occupants of these favored habitations were the nobles of Templeton, as Marmaduke was its king. They were the dwellings of two young men who were cunning in the law. An equal number of that class who chafed to the wants of the community under the title of storekeepers, and a disciple of Asculapius, who for a novelty brought more subjects into the world than he sent out of it. In the midst of this incongruous group of dwellings rose the mansion of the judge, towering above all its neighbors. It stood in the center of an enclosure of several acres, which was covered with fruit trees. Some of the latter had been left by the Indians, and began already to assume the moss and inclination of age, therein performing a very marked contrast to the infant plantations that peered over most of the picketed fences of the village. In addition to this show of cultivation were two rows of young Lombardy poplars, a tree but lately introduced into America, formerly lining either side of a pathway, which led from a gate that opened on the principal street to the front of the building. The house itself had been built entirely under the superintendence of a certain Mr. Richard Jones, who we have already mentioned, and who, from his cleverness in small manners, and an entire willingness to exert his talents, added to the circumstances of their being sisters' children, ordinarily superintended all the minor concerns of Marmaduke Temple. Richard was fond of saying that this child of invention consisted of nothing more nor less than what should form the groundwork of every clergyman's discourse, viz. Firstly, and lastly, he had commenced his labor in the first year of their residence by erecting a tall, gaunt edifice of wood, with its gable toward the highway. In this shelter, for it was little more, the family resided three years. By the end of that period, Richard had completed his design, 
he had availed himself in his heavy undertaking of the experience of a certain wandering eastern mechanic, who, by exhibiting a few soiled plates of English architecture, and talking learnedly of frises, entablatures, and particularly of the composite order, had obtained a very undue influence over Richard's taste in everything that pertained to that branch of the fine arts. Not that Mr. Jones did not affect to consider Hiram Doolittle a perfect empiric in his profession, being the constant habit of listening to his treatises on architecture with a kind of indulgent smile, yet either from an inability to oppose them by anything plausible from his own stores of learning, or from secret admiration, Richard generally submitted to the arguments of his co-adjutor. Together they had not only erected a dwelling for Marmaduke, but they had given a fashion to the architecture of the whole country. The composite order, Mr. Doolittle would contend, was an order composed of many others, and was intended to be the most useful of all, for it admitted into its construction such alterations as convenience or circumstances might require. To this proposition Richard usually assented, and when rival geniuses who monopolized not only all the reputation, but most of the money of a neighborhood, are of a mind, it is not uncommon to see them lead the fashion, even in grave matters. In the present instance, as we have already hinted, the castle, as Judge Templeton's dwelling was termed in common parlance, came to be the model, in some one or other of its numerous excellences, for every aspiring edifice within twenty miles of it. The house itself, or the lastly, was of stone, large, square, and far from comfortable. These were four requisites on which Marmaduke had insisted with a little more than his ordinary pernacity, but everything else was peaceably assigned to Richard and his associate. These worthies found the material a little too solid for the tools of their workmen, which in general were employed on a substance no harder than the white pine of the adjacent mountains a wood so proverbially soft that is commonly chosen by hunters for pillows. But, for this awkward dilemma, it is probable that the ambitious taste of our two architects would have left us more to do in the way of description. Driven from the faces of the house by the obduracy of the material, they took refuge in the porch and on the roof. The former, it was decided, should be severely classical, and the latter a rare specimen of the merits of the composite order. A roof, Richard contended, was a part of the edifice which the ancients always endeavored to conceal, it being an excrescence in architecture that was only to be tolerated on account of its usefulness. Besides, as he wittily added, a chief merit in a dwelling was to present a front on whichever side it might happen to be seen, for, as it was exposed to all eyes in all weathers, there should be no weak flank for envy or unneighborly criticism to assail. It was therefore decided that the roof should be flat, and with four faces. To this arrangement Marmaduke objected the snows that lay for months, frequently covering the earth, to a depth of three or four feet. Happily, the facilities of the composite order presented themselves to effect a compromise, and the rafters were lengthened, so as to give a descent that would carry off the frozen element. But unluckily, some mistake was made in the admeasurement of these material parts of the fabric, and one of the greatest recommendations of Hiram was his ability to work by the square rule. No opportunity was found of discovering the effect until the massive timbers were raised on the four walls of the building. Then, indeed, it was soon seen that, in defiance of all rule, the roof was by far the most conspicuous part of the whole edifice. Richard and his associate consoled themselves with the relief that the covering would aid in concealing this unnatural elevation. But every shingle that was laid only multiplied objects to look at, Richard essayed to remedy the evil with paint, and four different colors were laid on by his own hands. The first was a sky blue, 
in the vain expectation that the eye might be cheated into the belief it was the heavens themselves that hung so impossibly over Marmaduke's dwelling. The second was what he called a cloud color, being nothing more or less than an imitation of smoke. The third was what Richard termed an invisible green, an experiment that did not succeed against a background of sky. Abandoning the attempt to conceal, our architects drew from their invention for means to ornate the offensive shingles. After much deliberation and two or three essays by moonlight, Richard ended the affair by boldly covering the hole beneath a color that he christened Sunshine, a cheap way, as he assured his cousin, the judge, of always keeping fair weather over his head. The platform, as well as the caves of the house, were surmounted by gaudily painted railings, and the genius of Hiram was exerted in the fabrication of divers' urns and mouldings, which were scattered profusely around this part of their labors. Richard had originally a cunning expedient by which the chimneys were intended to be so low and so situated as to resemble ornaments on the balustrades, but comfort required that the chimneys should rise with the roof, in order that smoke might be carried off, and thus that became for extremely conspicuous objects in the view. As this roof was much the most important architectural undertaking in which Mr. Jones was ever engaged, his failure produced a correspondent degree of mortification. At first he whispered among his acquaintance that it proceeded from ignorance of the square rule on the part of Hiram but as his eye became gradually accustomed to the object, he grew better satisfied with his labors, and instead of apologizing for the defects, he commenced praising the beauties of the mansion-house. He soon found hearers, and, as wealth and comfort, are at all times attractive. It was, as has been said, made a model for imitation on a small scale. In less than two years from its erection, he had the pleasure of standing on the elevated platform, and of looking down on three humble imitators of its beauty. Thus it is ever with fashion, which ever renders the faults of the great subjects of admiration. Marmaduke bore his deformity in his dwelling with great good nature, and soon contrived, by his own improvements, to give an air of respectability and comfort to his place of residence. Still, there was much of incongruity even immediately about the mansion-house. Although poplars had been brought from Europe to ornament the grounds, and willows and other trees were gradually springing up nigh the dwelling, yet many a pile of snow betrayed the presence of the stump of a pine, and even in one or two instances unsightly remnants of trees that had been partly destroyed by fire were seen rearing their black glistening columns twenty or thirty feet above the pure white of the snow. These, which in the language of the country are termed stubs, abounded in the open fields adjacent to the village, and were accompanied occasionally by the ruin of a pine or a hemlock that had been stripped of its bark, and which waved in melancholy grandeur, its naked limbs to the blast, a skeleton of its former glory. But these and many other unpleasant additions to the view were unseen by the delighted Elizabeth, who, as the horses moved down the side of the mountain, saw only in gross the cluster of houses that lay like a map at her feet, the fifty smokes that were curling from the valley to the clouds, the frozen lake as it lay embedded in mountains of evergreen, with the long shadows of the pine on its white surface, lengthening in the setting sun, the dark ribbon of water that gushed from the outlet and was winding its way toward the distant Chesapeake, the altered, though still remembered, scenes of her childhood. Five years had wrought greater changes than a century would produce in countries where time and labor have given permanency to the works of man. To our young hunter and the judge the scene had less novelty, though none ever emerged from the dark forest of that mountain and witnessed the glorious scenery of that beauteous valley as it burst unexpectedly upon them, without a feeling of delight. The former cast one admiring glance from north to south, and sank his face again beneath the folds of his coat, while the latter contemplated with philanthropic pleasure 
the prospect of affluence and comfort that was expanding around him, the result of his own enterprise, and much of it the fruits of his own industry. The cheerful sound of sleigh bells, however, attracted the attention of the whole party as they came jingling up the sides of the mountain at a rate that announced a powerful team and a hard driver. The bushes which lined the highway interrupted the view, and the two sleighs were close upon each other before either was seen. End of chapter 3 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the spring of 2008. The Pioneers, or the Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Chapter four. Quote, How now? Whose mare's dead? What's the matter? Unquote. Falstaff. A large lumber sleigh, drawn by four horses, was soon seen dashing through the leafless bushes which fringed the road. The leaders were of gray, and the pole horses of a jet black. Bells innumerable were suspended from every part of the harness, where one of the tinkling balls could be placed, while the rapid movement of the equipage, in defiance of the steep ascent, announced the desire of the driver to ring them to the utmost. The first glance of this singular arrangement acquainted the judge with the character of those in the sleigh. It contained four male figures. On one of those stools that are used at writing desks, Lashed firmly to the sides of the vehicle was seated a little man, enveloped in a great coat fringed with fur, in such a manner that no part of him was visible except the face of an unvarying red color. There was a habitual upward look about the head of this gentleman, as if dissatisfied with its natural proximity to the earth, and the expression of his countenance was that of busy care. He was the charioteer and he guided the metalled animals along the precipice with a fearless eye and a steady hand. Immediately behind him, with his face toward the other two, was a tall figure, to whose appearance not even the duplicate overcoats which he wore, aided by the corner of a horse blanket, could give the appearance of strength. His face was protruding from beneath a woolen nightcap, and when he turned to the vehicle of Marmaduke, as the sleighs approached each other, it seemed formed by nature to cut the atmosphere with the least possible resistance. The eyes alone appeared to create any obstacle, for from either side of his forehead their light blue glassy balls projected. The sallow of his countenance was too permanent to be affected even by the intense cold of the evening. Opposite of this personage sat a solid, short, and square figure. No part of his form was to be discovered through his overdress, but a face that was illuminated by a pair of black eyes that gave the lie to every demure feature of his countenance. A fair jolly wig furnished a neat and rounded outline to his visage, and he, well as the other two, wore martin-skin caps. The fourth was a meek-looking, long-visaged man, without any other protection from the cold than that which was furnished by a black surcoat, made with some little formality, but which was rather threadbare and rusty. He wore a hat of extremely decent proportions, though frequent brushing had quite destroyed its nap. His face was pale, and withal a little melancholy, or what might be termed of a studious complexion. The air had given it, just now, a light and somewhat feverish flush. The character of his whole appearance, especially contrasted to the air of humor in his next companion, was that of habitual mental care. No sooner had the two sleighs approached within speaking distance than the driver of this fantastic equipage shouted aloud, Draw into the quarry, Agamemnon! 
or I shall never be able to pass you. Welcome home, cousin Doak. Welcome, welcome, black-eyed Bess. Thou seest, Marina Duke, that I have taken the field with an assorted cargo to do thee honor. Monsieur Le Coy has come with only one cap. Old Fritz would not stay to finish the bottle, and Mr. Grant has got to put the lastly to his sermon yet. Even all the horses would come by the by, Judge. I must sell the blacks for you immediately. They interfere, and the high one is a bad goer in double harness. I can get rid of them, too. Sell what thou wilt, Dickon, interrupted the cheerful voice of the judge, so that thou leavest my daughter and my lands. And Fritz, my old friend, this is a kind compliment. Indeed, for seventy to pay to five and forty. Monsieur Le Coy, I am your servant. Mr. Grant, lifting his cap, I feel indebted to your attention. Gentlemen, I make you acquainted with my child. Yours are names with which she is very familiar. Welcome, welcome, Tushi, said the elder of the party with a strong German accent. Miss Patsy, will thou owe me a kiss? And cheerfully I will pay it, my good sir, cried the soft voice of Elizabeth, which sounded in the clear air of the hills like tones of silver amid the loud cries of Richard. I always have a kiss for my old friend, Major Hartman. By this time the gentleman in the front seat, who had been addressed as Monsieur Le Coy, had risen with some difficulty, owing to the impediment of his overcoats, and steadying himself by placing one hand on the stool of the charioteer. With the other he removed his cap, and bowing politely to the judge and profoundly to Elizabeth, he paid his compliments. "'Cover my pole, Gaul! Cover my pole!' cried the driver, who was Mr. Richard Jones. "'Cover thy pole, or the forest will pluck out the remnant of thy locks!' Had the hairs on the head of Absalom been as scarce as thine, he might have been living to this day. The jokes of Richard never failed of exciting risibility, for he uniformly did honor to his own wit, and he enjoyed a hearty laugh on the present occasion, while Mr. Lecoy resumed his seat with a polite reciprocation in his mirth. The clergyman, for such was the office of Mr. Grant, modestly, though quite affectionately, exchanged his greetings with the travellers also, when Richard prepared to turn the heads of the horses homeward. It was in the quarry alone that he could effect this object, without ascending to the summit of the mountain. A very considerable excavation had been made in the side of the hill, at the point where Richard had succeeded in stopping the sleighs, from which the stones used for building the village were ordinarily quarried, and in which he now attempted to turn his team. Passing itself was a task of difficulty and frequently of danger in that narrow road, but Richard had to meet the additional risk of turning his fort in hand. The black civilly volunteered his services to take off the leaders, and the judge very earnestly seconded the major with his advice. Richard treated both proposals with great disdain. "'Why and wherefore, Cousin Duke?' he exclaimed a little angrily. The horses are as gentle as lambs. You know that I broke the leaders myself, and the pole horses are too near my whip to be restive. Here is Mr. Lecoy now, who must know something about driving, because he has rode out so often with me. I will leave it to Mr. Lecoy whether there is any danger. It was not in the nature of the Frenchman to disappoint expectations so confidently formed. Although... He sat looking down the precipice which fronted him, as Richard turned his leaders into the quarry, with a pair of eyes that stood out like those of lobsters. The German's muscles were unmoved, but his quick sight scanned each movement. Mr. Grant placed his hands on the side of the sleigh in preparation for a spring, but moral timidity deterred him from taking the leap that bodily apprehension strongly urged him to attempt. Richard by a sudden application of the whip, succeeded in forcing the leaders into the snowbank that covered the quarry. But the instant 
that the impatient animals suffered by the crust through which they broke at each step. They positively refused to move an inch further in that direction. On the contrary, finding that the cries and blows of their driver were redoubled at this juncture, the leaders backed upon the pole horses, who in turn backed the sleigh. Only a single log lay above the pile which upheld the road on the side toward the valley, and this was now buried in snow. The sleigh was easily bred across so slight an impediment, and before Richard became conscious of his danger, one half of the vehicle was projected over a precipice, which fell perpendicularly more than a hundred feet. The Frenchman who by his position had a full view of their threatened flight, instinctively threw his body as far forward as possible and cried, Oh, mon cher, mon cher Dick, mon dul, ich fights fool! Donner and blitzen, Richard! exclaimed the veteran German, looking over the side of the sleigh with unusual emotion. Put you will speak der sleigh in Kurt der Hulses! Good Mr. Jones, said the clergyman, be prudent, good sir! Be careful! Get up, obstinate devils! cried Richard, catching a bird's-eye view of his situation, and in his eagerness to move forward, kicking the stool on which he sat. Get up, I say! Duke, I shall have to sell the greys, too! They are the worst broken horses! Mr. Lacoy? Richard was too much agitated to regard his pronunciation, of which he was commonly a little vain. But, Sir Lacoy, pray get off my leg! You hold my leg so tight that it's a no wonder the horse is back. Merciful providence, exclaimed the judge. They will all be killed. Elizabeth gave a piercing shriek, and the black of Agamemnon's face changed to a muddy white. At this critical moment, the young hunter, who during the salutations of the parties had sat in rather sullen silence, sprang from the sleigh of Marmaduke to the heads of the refractory leaders. The horses which were yet suffering under the injudicious and somewhat random blows of Richard were dancing up and down with that ominous movement that threatens a sudden and uncontrollable start, still pressing backward. The youth gave the leaders a powerful jerk, and they plunged aside, and re-entered the road in the position in which they were first halted. The sleigh was whirled from its dangerous position and upset with the runners outward. The German and the Divine were thrown, rather unceremoniously, into the highway, but without danger to their bones. Richard appeared in the air, describing the segment of a circle, of which the reins were the radii, and landed at the distance of some fifteen feet, in that snowbank which the horses had dreaded, right end uppermost. Here, as he instinctively grasped the reins as a drowning man, seize its straws. He admirably served the purpose of an anchor. The Frenchman, who was on his legs in the act of springing from the sleigh, took an aerial flight also, much in the attitude which boys assume when they play leapfrog, and lying off in a tangent to the curvature of his course, came into the snow bank head foremost, where he remained exhibiting two latchy legs on high like scarecrows waving in a cornfield. Major Hartman, whose self-possession had been admirably preserved during the whole evolution, was the first of the party that gained his feet and his voice. "'The devil, Richard!' he exclaimed in a voice half-serious, half-comical. "'But you unload your sleigh very hotly!' It may be doubtful whether the attitude in which Mr. Grant continued for an instant after his overthrow was the one into which he had been thrown, or was assumed, in humbling himself before the power that he reverenced, in thanksgiving at his escape. When he rose from his knees, he began to gaze about him, with anxious looks, after the welfare of his companions, while every joint in his body trembled with nervous agitation. There was some confusion in the facilities of Mr. Jones also, but as the mist gradually cleared from before his eyes, he saw that all was safe, and with an air of great self-satisfaction, he cried, Well, that was neatly safe, anyhow. 
It was a lucky thought in me to hold on to the reins, or the fiery devils would have been over the mountain by this time. How well I recovered myself! Duke, another moment would have been too late, but I knew just the spot where to touch the off-leader. That blow under his right flank, and the sudden jerk I gave the rein, brought them round quite in rule. I must own myself. Footnote. The spectators, from a memorial usage, have a right to laugh at the casualties of a sleigh ride, and the judge was no sooner certain that no one was done that he made full use of the privilege. End footnote. Thou jerk! Thou recover thyself, Dickon, he said, but for that brave lad yonder, thou and thy horses, or rather mine, would have been dashed to pieces. Where is Monsieur Le Coy? Oh, mon cher judge, mon ami, cried the smothered voice, praise be God I live. Will you, Mr. Agamemnon, be pleased come down, I see, and help me on my leg? The divine and the negro seized the incarcerated Gaul by his legs, and extricated him from a snowbank of three feet in depth, whence his voice had summoned as from the tombs. The thoughts of Mr. Lacoy immediately on his liberation were not extremely collected, and when he reached the light he threw his eyes upward in order to examine the distance he had fallen. His good humor returned, however, with a knowledge of his safety though it was some little time before he clearly comprehended the case. "'What, monsieur?' said Richard, who was busily assisting the black in taking off the leaders. "'Are you there? I thought I saw you flying toward the top of the mountain just now.' "'Praise be God, I no fly down into the lake,' returned the Frenchman, with a visage that was divided between pain occasioned by a few large scratches that he had received in forcing his head through the crust, and the look of compliance that seemed natural to his pliable features. "'Ah, oh, mon cher, Mr. Dick, what you do next? There be nothing you no try.' "'The next thing, I trust, will be to learn to drive,' said the judge, who had busied himself in throwing the buck together with several other articles of baggage from his own sleigh into the snow. Here are seats for you all, gentlemen. The evening grows piercingly cold, and the hour approaches for the service of Mr. Grunt. We will leave friend Jones to repair the damages, with the assistance of a gomenon, and hasten to a warm fire. Here, Dickon, are a few articles of best trumpery that you can throw into your sleigh when ready and there is also a deer of my taking that I will thank you to bring. Aggie, remember that there will be a visit from Santa Claus tonight. Footnote. The periodic visits of St. Nicholas, or Santa Claus, as he is termed, were never forgotten among the inhabitants of New York, until the immigration from New England brought in the opinions and usages of the Puritans. Like the bon homme de Noel, he arrives at each Christmas. End footnote. The black grinned, conscious of the bribe that was offered him for silence on the subject of the deer, while Richard, without in the least waiting for the termination of his cousin's speak, began his reply. Learn to dry, sayest thou, cousin Duke. Is there a man in the country who knows more of horse flesh than myself? Who broke in the filly that no one else dare mount? though your coachman did pretend that he had tamed her before I took her in hand. But anybody could see that he lied. He, he was a great liar. That, John, what's, what's that, a buck? Richard abandoned the horses and ran to the spot where Marmaduke had thrown the deer. It's a buck. I am amazed. Yes, there are two holes in him. He has fired both barrels and hit him each time. E God! How Marmaduke will brag! He is a prodigious bragger about any small matter like this. Now, well, to think that Duke has killed a buck before Christmas. There will be no such thing as living with him. They are both bad shots, though. Mere chance, mere chance now. I never fired twice at a cloven foot in my life. It is hit or miss with me. Dead or run away. Had it been a bear or a wildcat, 
a man might have wanted both barrels. Here, you Aggie, how far off was the judge when this buck was shot? Oh, Massa Richard, maybe a ten rod, cried the black, bending under one of the horses with the pretense of fastening a buckle, but in reality to conceal the grin that had opened a mouth from ear to ear. Ten rod? echoed the other. Why, Aggie, the deer I killed last winter was at twenty, yes. If anything, it was nearer thirty than twenty. I wouldn't shoot a deer at ten rod. Besides, you may remember, Aggie, I only fired once. Yes, Massa Richard, I remember him. Natty Bumpo fire the other gun. You know, sir, all the folks say Natty kill him. The folks lie, you black devil, exclaimed Richard, in great heat. I have not shot a gray squirrel for these four years to which that old rascal has not laid claim, or someone else or him. This is a damned envious world that we live in. People are always for dividing the credit at a thing in order to bring down merit to their own level. Now they have a story about the patent that Hiram Doolittle helped plan the steeple to St. Paul's, when Hiram knows that it is entirely mine. A little taken from a print of his namesake in London, I own, but essentially, as to all points of genius, my own. Footnote. The grants of land made either by the crown or the state were but letters patent under the great seal, and the term patent is usually applied to any district of extent thus conceded, though under the crown, manorial rights being often granted with the soil, in the older counties, the word manor is frequently used. There are many manors in New York, though all political and judicial rights have ceased. I don't know where he came from, said the black, losing every mark of humor in the expression of admiration. But everybody say he wonderful handsome. And well they may say so, Aggie, cried Richard, leaving the buck and walking up to the negro with the air of a man who has new interest awakening in him. I think I may say, without bragging, that it is the handsomest and the most scientific country church in America. I know that the Connecticut settlers talk about their West Herfield meeting house, but I never believe more than half what they say. They are such unconscionable braggers. Just as you have got a thing done, if they see it likely to be successful, they are always for interfering. And then it's tea to one, but they lay claim to half, or even all of the credit. You may remember, Aggie, when I painted the sign of the bold dragoon for Captain Hollister, there was that fellow who was about town laying brick dust on the horses, came one day and offered to mix what I call the streaky black for the tail and mane, and then, because it looks like horse hair, he tells everybody that the sign was painted by himself and Squire Jones. If Marmaduke don't send that fellow off the patent, he may ornament his village with his own hands for me. Here Richard paused a moment, and cleared his throat by a loud hem, while the negro, who was all this time busily engaged in preparing the sleigh, proceeded with his work in respectful silence. Owing to the religious scruples of the judge, Aggie was the servant of Richard, who had his service for a time and who, of course, commanded a legal claim to the respect of the young negro. Footnote. The manumission of the slaves in New York has been gradual. When public opinion became strong in their favor, there grew up a custom of buying the services of a slave for six or eight years, with a condition to liberate him at the end of the period. Then the law provided that all born after a certain day should be free the males at twenty-eight, and the females at twenty-five. After this, the owner was obliged to cause his servants to be taught to read and write before they reached the age of eighteen, and finally that few that remained were all unconditionally liberated in 1826, or after the publication of this tale. It was quite unusual for men more or less connected with the Quakers, who have never held slaves to adopt the first expedient. End footnote. But when any dispute between his lawful and his real master occurred, 
the black felt too much deference for both to express any opinion. In the meanwhile, Richard continued watching the negro as he fastened buckle after buckle, until, stealing a look of consciousness toward the other, he continued, Now, if that young man who was in your sleigh is a real Connecticut settler, he will be telling everybody how he saved my horses, when if he had just let them alone for half a minute longer, I would have brought them in much better, without upsetting with the whip, and amid rain it spoils a horses to give him his heel. I should not wonder if I had to sell the whole team just for that one jerk he gave him. Richard paused and hemmed, for his conscience smote him a little for censuring a man who had just saved his life. Who is the lad, Aggie? I don't remember to have seen him before. The black recollected the hint about Santa Claus, and while he briefly exclaimed how they had taken up the person in question on the top of the mountain, he forbore to add anything concerning the accident or the wound, only saying that he believed the youth was a stranger. It was so usual for men of the first rank to take into their sleighs any one they found toiling through the snow, that Richard was perfectly satisfied with this explanation. He heard Aggie with great attention, and then remarked, Well, if the lad has not been spoiled by the people in Templeton, he may be a modest young man, and he certainly meant well. I shall take some notice of him, perhaps, in his land hunting, I say. Aggie, maybe he is out hunting. Ah, oh, yes, Massa Richard, said the black, a little confused, for as Richard did all the flogging, he stood in great terror of his master in the main. Yes, sir, I believe he be. He had a pack and an axe? No, sir, only he rifle. Rifle! exclaimed Richard observing the confusion of the negro, which now amounted to terror. "'By Jove, he killed the deer! I knew that Marmaduke couldn't kill a buck on the jump. How was it? Aggie, tell me all about it, and I'll roast do quicker than he can roast his saddle. How was it, Aggie?' "'The lad shot the buck, and the judge bought it. Ah! And he was taking the youth down to get the pay?' The pleasure of this discovery had put Richard in such a good humor that the negro's fears in some measure vanished, and he remembered the stalking of Santa Claus. After a gulp or two, he made out to reply, "'You forget it. A two-shot, sir.' "'Don't lie, you black rascal!' cried Richard, stepping on the snow bank to measure the distance from his lash to the negro's back. "'Speak truth, or I'll trounce you.' While speaking, the stock was slowly raising in Richard's right hand, and the lash drawing through his left, in the scientific manner which drummers apply the cat. And Agamemnon, after turning each side of himself toward his master and finding both equal unwilling to remain there, fairly gave in. In a very few words he made his master acquainted with the truth, at the same time earnestly conjuring Richard to protect him from the displeasure of the judge. "'I'll do it, boy, I'll do it,' cried the other, rubbing his hands with delight. "'Say nothing but leave me to Manny Duke. "'I have a great mind to leave the deer on the hill "'and to make the fellow send for his own carcass. "'But no, I will let Marmaduke tell a few bounces about it "'before I come upon him. "'Come, hurry in, Aggie. "'I must help to dress the lad's wound. "'This Yankee doctor knows nothing of surgery.' I had to hold out Milligan's leg for him while he cut it off. Footnote. In America, the term Yankee is of local meaning. It is thought to be derived from the manner in which the Indians of New England pronounce the word English, or Yankees. New York, being originally a Dutch province, the term, of course, was not known there. And farther south, different dialects among the natives themselves probably produced a different pronunciation. Marmaduke and his cousin, being Pennsylvanians by birth, were not Yankees in the American sense of the word. End footnote. Richard was now seated on the stool again, and, the black taking the hind seat, the steeds were put in motion toward home. As they dashed down the hill on a fast trot, the driver occasionally turned his face to Aggie and continued speaking, for, notwithstanding their recent rupture, 
the most perfect cordiality was again existing between them. This goes to prove that I turned the horses with the rein, for no man who is shot in the right shoulder can have strength enough to bring round such obstinate devils. I knew I did it from the first, but I did not want to multiply words with Marmaduke about it. Will you bite, you villain? Hip, boys, hip! Oh, Natty, too! That is the best of it. Well, well, Duke will say no more about my dear, and the judge fired both barrels, and hit nothing but a poor lad who was behind a pine tree. I must help that quack to take out the buckshot for the poor fellow. In this manner Richard descended the mountain, the bells ringing and his tongue going until they entered the village, when the whole attention of the driver was devoted to a display of his horsemanship, to the admiration of all the gaping women and children who thronged the windows to witness the arrival of their landlord and his daughter. End of chapter 4 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in December of 2008.